What a day already. Isn't it exciting? I can't believe we're here already, like we're already at Christmas. Isn't that hard to believe? I mean, really, it's, it's just so crazy that we're at the end of 2021. And our announcement, how about that announcement for Heart of the House? Yeah. Wow, wow. And I have another announcement that I don't think that uh, we talked about yet, and this is gonna be for some of you, but not all of you, and it's something I'm super excited about. Spanx has come out with pants. Yes, yes, you know who you are. And if you need a preview, right here, right here. It's not for everybody, it's for somebody, and it's like, Parents being at a birthday party and they have that balloon and the kid, they say, don't pop the balloons. It's gonna scare people. Don't put a pin in these anywhere. If it pops, it's gonna scare y'all today. It's not a pretty sight. We're gonna be a little bit organic today. I hope that's okay with you guys. I thought the week before Christmas, I just really felt like God was prompting me to do a little bit of a different message today. And um, it's kind of why the lights are a little bit dim. I'll let you in on a little secret. We're making the mood happen. Uh, if you start to fall asleep and I see your eyes, because I can see you, all your eyes, we're gonna flip blinders on. So if you like it like this, keep those eyes wide open, pay attention. Here's a question that we're gonna answer today. The question is this, how do you prepare the way for Jesus to do a work in you? Right now we're in a series called Prepare the Way. We're preparing for Jesus to come. We're preparing for his birth. But my question to you is, how do you personally prepare the way for Jesus to do a work in your life? How do you do that? So I want us to just slow down a little today. We're in the hustle and bustle. We're still shopping. I'm still gonna go on Monday and get some last minute things. Crazy at that, as that sounds. But I wanna look at that question. How do you prepare the way for Jesus to do a work in you? And today I have three specific thoughts that I wanna go over with you. I'm gonna talk about these three things that God has really laid on my heart. And what I really pray as we get started is that our hearts are ready to receive what God has for us. And I'm gonna start on the front end today of things because every week at TE, I believe God extends an invitation to us. I think he extends this invitation and the invitation is for transformation in our lives. The invitation is for change. The invitation is for us maybe to turn directions and go on a little bit of a different path than we've already been on. And God is so kind in his invitation. He extends that inv invitation, but just like any invitation that you would get in the mail, you have to decide whether you accept that invitation or not. And you know, some people that you invite to the party, maybe it's holiday season for you and you've sent out invitations and people are supposed to RSVP and you've got those certain people that right away, they're texting you back, getting back to you with the answer. And there's some people who are like, wow, are you coming? You didn't even respond. And I think it's kind of like that with God. You know, all the time that we're in here, he's extending this invitation and he knows our hearts, he knows where we are. And he's extending this to us and saying, here's this invitation, like it's free of charge. You can come to the party. But do you wanna to come to the party? Like, do you wanna be a part of this? Are you ready to respond? And so that's why I wanted to do this at the beginning because I want you already thinking about the invitation. I don't want us to wait till the end and then hear the invitation. I want you to think about the invitation because the invitation is all through the message. It's weaved in and out. God has prepared this time for you in this space to hear something that only you can hear. But here's the thing. I can give you all the encouragement I can give you all the scripture, I can tell you all the stories and all the accounts, but I can't make the decision to answer the invitation. Only you can do that. Only you can do that today. So I want you just to think about that as we move forward in this message and that you're gonna have your heart prepared for that. As I kind of go into this first thought of how to prepare the way for Jesus to do and work in you. And the first one is this, the first thought is this. Information about God is not a substitute for intimacy with God. Information about God is not a substitute for intimacy with God. See, there's a misconception that the information about God is a substitute, but it isn't. You can come here every week and hear information, but your life may never be changed. You can come here every week and absorb the words that are coming in, but they don't penetrate deep down into the spaces where God wants you to change and transform. 
See, sitting in a service does not take the place of spending time with God. I'm going to say it again. Sitting in a service does not take the place of spending time with God. In fact, Jeremiah 9 says this. This is what the Lord says. The wise man is not to boast in his wisdom. The strong man is not to boast in his strength. And the rich man is not to boast in his riches. Rather, let the one who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. For I am the Lord who acts with gracious love and justice and righteousness in the land, and I delight in these things. See, he delights in your relationship. He delights in your intimacy. He likes the fact that you come to church. He loves the fact that you come to church. But he really, really savors and delights in the intimacy that he can have time to spend with you. So the question is this, how do I spend more time with God? How do I get intimate with God? The first thing is this, intimacy with God starts with talking to God. Now, let me just preface before I go any farther. You might say, wow, this sounds like a really basic message. It is, it's super basic. We're going back to the basics. See, we're coming into 2022. We just made it through all of 2021. Let's give God a praise for that. We made it through, we made it through. But here we are, we're going yet into another season. And what I really feel is I wanna provide a foundational perspective for you. It might be a reminder for some, but man, it might be something new for many of you. We gotta be on a foundation, a strong foundation to be ready for what's coming. We don't know what's coming in 2022. Shoot, you don't know what's gonna happen when you walk out of these doors today. So if I can give you a foundation today and I can help you with some of the basics, I hope that this is going to catapult you to another place where you've not been before. So let's start with this. Intimacy with God starts with talking to God. What does that mean? We pray. We pray. We spend time in conversation with God. We have that intimate time with Him that only you and God can have together. And what I wanna do right now is I wanna start with us praying, but I want you to pray for the person next to you. If you're with somebody right now and you can hold their hand, you go ahead and do that. You can touch them on the leg. Now, it might be weird if you're with a stranger. Let's not, let's not cross lines here today. Don't cross lines here today, but I want us to pray for someone next to us. Let's just close our eyes and pray. God, I thank you for this person who is next to me, God, that they have taken a step to come into this church, God. And I pray right now that, Father, you begin to speak into their hearts. That, God, right now, that they just open the window into their soul, God, and you can just in, inject yourself in their Father into the, the deep places, the hurting places, the broken places, God. Those places that only are seen by you, Father. But right now that you would be the one, God, that would invade that space, Father. That the invitation that you give that person today, that person right next to me, God, that they would accept it. That they would be willing to accept that inv- invitation and begin to walk more strongly with you today, God. So thank you for them. Thank you for us being here together and being a body of Christ together, God. And we just love you and we prayed in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. Now the second place of intimacy with God starts with reading God's word. Now, some of y'all don't have one of these. You know what this is? This is called the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I forget the rest of it, just da-da-da, on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, right? I don't know the rest of it, but you guys can Google that. This Bible is hands-on, paper, brick-and-mortar Bible. In fact, this Bible, it's so cool. Um, This is my original Bible, June 1st of 1980, when I graduated high school. Y'all are like, when's 1980 again, some of you guys, right? When was 1980? And my Sunday school superintendent, Virginia Martin, um, signed this in here on my pastor. So I've had this Bible for quite a long time, and I don't know if you can see it all, but this was the Bible that I kind of started out with, and when I got really excited about Jesus again, you can see I kind of marked it up, and I wrote in there, and actually, these pages actually come out. They're not supposed to, but they do. And the thing about the Bible that is different than, um, well, let me just say it this way. If you have a Bible with an off-on switch, that's fantastic but you need one of these two. You need one of these two. Why? You can get intimate in this Bible. You can go and and you can hear, you can say, okay, I'm gonna go back to the Old Testament. When you're on your phone, what does back mean? 
Back means I'm going to a different place. I'm gonna go back to the Old Testament and then I'm gonna go forward into the New Testament. So there's some relevance in seeing that visually that's different than what you get on an iPad or whatever your Inus is, iPhone or whatever Inus you have. You can write in this. In fact, I recommend that you write in it, that you scribble in it, that you put things. I have dates in here of when God spoke into my heart. I have um, scripture that I read in one season and then I would go back a year later and read it again. It would be completely different. Like he's speaking completely different. I don't know if, if you've had that happen to you or not. Just a whole different thing. So here's the cool thing though. If you don't have one of these and you're not able to get one, part of our Heart for the House offering is actually going to buy a thousand Bibles. So we wanna have Bibles for everybody. Now, if you can't wait, and if you can't wait to get the Bible, just go on, on, online and grab one. Like there are all kinds and there are all kinds of really cool versions, but you need one of these. You need something that you can hold on to. And I have to tell you this, that the Bible is not a rule book. God doesn't have this Bible to beat you on the head with. This Bible is a love story. This Bible is encouragement. This Bible is something, the word of truth, when there's no truth around us, this Bible has the word of truth in it. Truth. You may have done something bad, but see, God through his word of truth wants to show you how good you really are. He wants to look at you with loving eyes. He's not angry with you. You know, people will say, well, God of the Old Testament's an angry God and God of the New Testament's like um, Jesus with long hair extensions and floppy sandals. And, you know, we got through all this imagery. Listen, God is the same then, now, and tomorrow. Jesus is the same before, now, and then. Like, he doesn't change. So he's not angry with you. In fact, he loves you so much. That's why we have this word to be able to hold on to, to learn what the truth is. So that's the first thought, thought, that you need to um, have intimacy with God by reading God's word. The second one is this, how do you prepare the way for Jesus to do a work in you? Hold on to this thought. Don't confuse guarding your heart with hardening your heart. Guarding will protect you, hardening will paralyze you. Two different things can happen in your heart. You can guard it or you can harden it and there are so many people today who are in here and you have your arms crossed your spiritual arms I saw you I'm I know I, saw, I know no shame no shame in your game Stan no shame he was like no my arms are folded I'm gonna sit on them the whole time no shame spiritual arms spiritual arms today they're crossed you know do you know that um, crossing your arms has so many uh, it, it means a lot a lot of different things so sometimes we cross our arms because we're trying to protect ourselves, protecting ourselves because we've been hurt and, and we're just protecting like, like our soul almost. Other times it's a defensive thing. Don't you tell me what I can't do and people stand with their arms folded like this. You know, don't you tell me, right? A little bit of defense. It's the universal sign for when you feel threatened by something. You fold your arms, you protect yourself. But what I'm concerned about when I see people folding their spiritual arms is that it's not a protective stance, it's a hardening stance. Now, when I was um, little, I was a nerdy, independent girl with this crazy pixie haircut. Anybody remember those haircuts? Yeah, so I was that girl and I was the one, I, like I was independent, I was five years old and literally wanted my own alarm clock. Don't wake me up mom and dad, I got it. I'll wake you up, I'll wake you up for work. I also did kind of weird things like I would go out on adventures and I would collect things. I was a collector of a lot of stuff and I had this box and I collected things like rocks and driftwood and you know, I, I just think about when I say that, where do you find driftwood in West Virginia? I found it, like I found driftwood. I thought it was driftwood, that's what I called it was driftwood. Shells, I collected old dolls and I collected turtles, like these plastic and ceramic turtles. But I had this box that it was, it was pretty big and each collection was in its specific area and I had like lines drawn with a magic marker that I would put in there. And I would get that box out about once a week and I would look at all of my collections and I'd pull them out and I'd mess with them a little bit then I'd put them back in and I'd close the lid. 
And I thought about that with us. And I thought, you know, so many of us with our hearts that are hardened, I think what it is is we've got this big box, this collection of things that have hurt us and damaged us and put us in places where we wouldn't want to be and kept us from being all that we could be. And what we do is we open that box periodically and we take a look at the collection. We're like, okay, there's my hurt. There's my anger. There's my abuse. There's my, uh, the person that left me. There's uh, my, my kid who hasn't come home. There's all these things in this box. We open it up and we look at it and then we close it and we shove it under the bed and we tuck it away until we bring it out one more time and we open the box again. We look at our collection of all the things that are making our heart hard. See, that's not what God wants for our hearts. He doesn't say harden your heart. He says, guard your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says this, above all else, guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. What does that mean? Your heart's valuable. It has value. It's the source of everything that you do. When you guard your heart, it protects you from those things that God wants to keep out of your life. I'm gonna protect myself. I'm gonna help myself to not listen to the people around me, but to only listen to God's word. I'm not gonna walk in that direction. I'm gonna walk where God wants me to walk. But when you harden your heart, you block everything that God wants to do. He cannot flow through you freely because you're hard. Got your arms, spiritual arms crossed. You don't want a part of what he's doing. And you know, I found myself a couple years ago in the emergency room, I've talked about this, but I'm gonna share with you guys ever so briefly. And I was in there for atrial fibrillation, I was in the ER, and I quickly had to learn how to guard my heart. I had to learn how to stop drinking caffeine quickly. I had to learn how to take medication because I realized I've only got one heart and I gotta keep it. And I gotta keep it well, why? Because God wants that blood to fro flow freely through me so that I can function like he wants me to function. That's our spiritual visionary too. Our heart needs to be flowing freely when we harden those places, man, and we keep opening the box and we keep looking at the collections and then shoving them under the bed. We're not getting anywhere. It's literally like I'm walking around this and I'm just going in a circle and I'm just going to keep going in a circle because you know what, God, I'm just going to, I'm going to ignore everything that you're wanting me to see. I want to be in a place today where God can show me all about myself. I don't know about you, it's a hard place to be. It's not a fun place to be. It's hard when you have to start to take the collections out of the box. You gotta replace them with something else. There's a vulnerability there that can only happen when you begin to soften your heart. But listen, if that's you today, no shame. I want you to know it's okay if you're in that place. In fact, this is the best place that you can be today. If you have a hardened heart, listen, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad, welcome to TE Church. Welcome to TE. Because listen, God can soften the hardest of hearts. I've seen it happen. It's happened in me. I've seen him soften. And he, listen, he's a good God. He's a good God. People may not have been good to you, but God will always be good to you. So you can't lose hope in God, even when you've lost hope in other people, because the warmth and the goodness of who he is will penetrate through any type of hardness that you have right now. You have to open up your heart. So even if you're crossed, your arms are crossed today, it's not over for you. This can just be a new beginning because God wants to meet you right where you are today, amen? Now, in our little bit of remainder of time together, I wanna to talk about a story, an account, that is found in um, Luke. Before I do that, I wanna say what my third thought is on how you can prepare the way for Jesus to do a work in you, and it's this. You need to allow Jesus to see your infirmity. You need to allow him to see the infirmity. Now, I'm just gonna keep going and explain it a little bit more. We're gonna look at an account in the Bible, in the book of Luke. Now, let me tell you where Luke is. Luke is the third gospel in the New Testament. So listen, if you had your paper Bible, you could go, okay, Old Testament's over here, New Testament's here, and it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are called the gospels. The gospels are the good news. Those four books of the Bible, let me tell you, if you've never read the Bible before, you start right there. Don't start back in Genesis. Start in the gospel and the good news and find out what Jesus is all about. Then you can go back to that Old Testament. But start there. So the third book of the Bible, Luke, who is Luke? Luke is the only non-Jewish writer of the New Testament. And he was a physician, he was a doctor. 
So his purpose in writing this was to make sure that people understood who Jesus was, that he was who he said he was, but also that he was a Jesus of miracles, that he performed miracles. I think Luke intentionally did that because he was a doctor. And he thought, you know what, I can give medication, I can do all the herbs, I can do all the stuff, I can help people with their broken arm, but man, Jesus does it different. He doesn't have all that stuff. He does it a little bit differently. He just touches somebody, they get healed. I think he wanted to let people know who Jesus is. So we see in Luke 13, a story of a woman who allows Jesus to see her infirmity. Let's take a look with me. Luke 13, 10 starts out with this. Now he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. She was bent over and could, could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. I wanna break this down for you. We're gonna start with verse 10. Now, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. See, at that time, this is the last recorded time that Jesus preached in a public setting before he went to his crucifixion. And he was teaching in a synagogue. Now you have to picture it. It was wall-to-wall people. Um, listen, people were calling each other and texting each other and saying, hey man, you gotta hear, you gotta get here. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue today. And all the people came. Before that, there were like 5,000 people who had come to hear him preach on the side of a mountain. So they're coming into the synagogue. And I think it would be much like this. In fact, I think it would even be more than this. I think there would be people just wall-to-wall people. Couldn't get enough people in to hear Jesus because man, Jesus is coming to town. And let me go to verse 11. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years, and she was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. The first thing that Luke shows us in this verse, in this set of verses, is there was a woman. There was a woman. See, not only did the men who were in the synagogue know that that Jesus was coming, but this woman heard that Jesus was coming. You know, she heard about God's kingdom. She heard about this man who did miracles. And she thought to herself, maybe, just maybe, he can heal me. Maybe he can heal me. Maybe I can get close to him. I don't know if I can or not. Because she knew her limitations. The woman had limitations. And I want to read some of these limitations for you back in that day. The fact was that women were not permitted to enter the temple beyond the court of women. There was a court for women, but they couldn't step over the line and go into the general assembly. They had to stay back by themselves. Women were not permitted to participate in the worship at the synagogue. Again, um, back in the court of women. Women can only be spectators, not participators. They couldn't speak. They couldn't worship, they just had to stand and watch. A man was not permitted to talk to a woman, even his wife. And the woman that we're talking about today was probably not ever going to get close to Jesus because in the eyes of all of the people, she was unfit, she was unworthy, and she was unwanted. And maybe you're here today and you understand that about being unfit, about being unworthy and being unwanted. like. Maybe you know what it's like to be unwanted for the party. Maybe you didn't get the invitation. And maybe you know what it's like not to be picked for the team. You wanted to be on the team, but man, they picked somebody else and they overlooked you. Or maybe you've been excluded because of your ethnicity, because of your background, your past, or maybe because of your gender. But that's where that woman was that day. See, there was a woman. And the second thing that Luke shows us is this. Not only was there a woman, but the woman had a spirit of infirmity. Now, the woman wasn't given a name, but she was recognized and known by her condition, that she had a spirit of infirmity. It wasn't Mary. It wasn't Josephina. It was the woman with the spirit of infirmity. What is infirmity in the Bible when we're talking about that? It's a physical or a mental weakness that she had. Now, when... When Luke uses the word spirit, he's not talking about a demon. He's talking about a spiritual state of mind. He's not talking about a thing, a demon. Because see, this woman, she was bent over. She could not raise herself up physically. She was unable to do this. And this physical condition literally put her into, we believe, severe depression. Maybe it was shame. 
Maybe it was embarrassment. We're not sure exactly what it was, but it was some kind of spirit of infirmity that she had. I mean, she was double over. And maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you've gotten the diagnosis. And you know that there's nothing you can do about it, but you've got that spirit of heaviness that's on you. Or possibly you had surgery and it was complicated and it's affected you mentally. Maybe you've been there. But she was bent over for 18 years. 18 years. Some of the historians say that this was called kyphosis. Kyphosis is an outward curvature of the spine, and it happens, and there is nothing that you can do about it. You're bent over, and you cannot stand up. So there's this woman for 18 years looking at people out of the corner of her eye because she cannot raise her head. She's only looking at the sandals of the people around her, the dirt on the ground. She would never gaze at the sun in the way that she had before because her head was down for 18 years. So this woman had something that she she couldn't raise up physically and she was weighed down mentally. Can you picture it? She couldn't raise up physically and she was weighed down mentally. You guys, those are two opposing things happen happening at the same time. There's nowhere she can go. There's nothing she can do. There's, it's all beyond her power and her ability to change that situation. And some of you know what this feels like. Maybe you haven't been harboring something for 18 years, but maybe you've been harboring it for 20 years. Or maybe you've been, it's been a good five years and you're still harboring that thing and it's mentally weighing you down. The weight that you experience is so great, you're like, I don't even know if I can stand up. It's a spirit of infirmity that you have on you. And Luke, the physician, talks about her by saying she was bent over and could not raise up. She could not do it. She went to every doctor in town and everyone said, there's nothing we can do. No one could help her. Some scholars say that she did have a demon, but how do we know that she did not have a demon? Well, all of the references to Jesus with demons are two things. He calls out to the name of the demon. He speaks to the demon, and then he does not touch the person. And what we find in our scripture is this, but when Jesus saw her, he called her to him, and he said, woman, you are loose from your infirmity, and he laid hands on her, and immediately she was straight and glorified God. You see, he didn't speak to a demon, he spoke to her. It was something that could be healed. But he saw her and he called to her, but he expected something from her. But the third thought about how you can prepare the way for Jesus to do a work in you is this. Bring your infirmity to Jesus. Bring your infirmity to Jesus. We just said that, but I'm reiterating because in the middle of Jesus teaching, With hundreds of people around, hundreds of men, scholars, avid learners, ones who were ready to receive, even though they may not have agreed with him as a person, they really were impressed with his teaching. So in the middle of all that, he ends up moving from instruction to invitation. He goes from instructing people to inviting someone. Every ounce of the responsibility though was on the woman. He called her to him. He didn't go to her and say, you're healed. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. He didn't come to the person. He asked the person to come to him. Bring your infirmity to Jesus. Bring your infirmity to Jesus. Bring your infirmity to Jesus. Don't wait for him to go. Bring your infirmity to Jesus. Are you with me? Bring your infirmity to Jesus. So Jesus saw her, this woman. But here's the thing about seeing her. Again, hundreds of people in the room, all the faces looking at him, but somehow in the court of women, he looked back and he saw her back there. Maybe it was in the dark place, I don't know exactly where it was, but he saw her back there. Now, he saw something that not everybody saw because everybody else's face was here and he was instructing and he was leading and he was teaching, but somehow he saw her. My dad was a college professor at Georgia Tech University. My dad is probably the smartest, well not probably, he's the smartest man that I know. 
And I apologize ahead of time because if you're friends with him on Facebook, he says, says some things that are a little bit, but that's not my responsibility. That's my dad's responsibility. Nonetheless, he's a super smart guy. And he was teaching at Georgia Tech University. He was a professor of linguistics. He had his PhD when he was 26, 27 years old. He's a brilliant man. And um, my mom worked at what was called Emory University. She was an executive secretary full time. And my dad was working at Georgia Tech University. You can see why I was a nerdy kid. Can you not? Right? So he would take me to work sometimes because he would have, um, my, my mom couldn't pick me up from school. So he would pick me up and he would take me to the office. And all of these guys were there, these really smart like guys. My dad taught German, he taught Chinese, he taught Latin. He was a, that professor that taught languages. So all these guys around were just as smart as him. And I would walk in this room and I would like, I would be perfectly content eating sugar cubes, dad. Like I sat in his office and I ate the sugar cubes. But the thing about my dad is it didn't matter how many people were in the room. If I needed him for something, he always saw me. I had a great dad, he always saw me. He could pick me out even when all the other guys were talking to him and they were in this big debate and big discussion. I'd just go, hey dad, you know, I need something. He saw me. See, Jesus sees her. Amidst all of it, he notices her. We all know what it's like to want to be noticed. You know, Betsy, Larissa, and Kate, and our three daughters, when they were little, we had this hearth on our fireplace, and they would stand up on it, and they would dance and sing, Mommy, watch me. Mommy, watch me. And I'm telling you, I would stop everything. I didn't care what I was doing. I'd sit on the couch and watch them for a little bit. I'd sit on the floor and watch them. I'm telling you, if they did it right now at 28, 26, and 22, I'd still sit there and watch them, as weird as that would be. Watch me dance and sing on the hearth of the fireplace. I would still do it. I would stop everything to see my girls. But see, when Jesus saw her, he did something that most of us would never do in the setting that we're in right now. He called her out. He recognized her infirmity. He recognized the disability that she had, that she was bent over. Most of us would not acknowledge that. We would not see that. We would not look at that. We would, we would turn away from that. But see, Jesus didn't. His response was so incredible, by all accounts, it should have been different than it was because he was a teacher in the synagogue. But he said something that he did not have to say. He said, come closer, woman. Now, for some of you ladies, that might be a little rude. Don't call me woman. I'm gonna be called woman. Well, let me tell you what it was like back in the day. Woman was an affectionate term because there was a time in the Bible where Jesus was teaching in a home and his mom was outside and his mom wanted to talk to him and he said, woman! My time is here. And it sounded, I always thought, wow, how do you talk to your mom like that? But that's not what it was. Mom was the same thing as like, honey, sweetheart. It was an affectionate term for women in that day. So when he said, woman, come here, it was an affectionate term. And I wonder, you know, there she was bent over. She was bent over. She couldn't even see who was talking to her. She knew it was Jesus. She couldn't see him. And I wonder, this isn't in scripture, but I wonder if she hesitated, if maybe he would have come over and, and just kind of got under her and kind of looked at her and said, yeah, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you, woman. Woman that I love so much. I know that you can't see me when I'm standing straight, when, you're, when I'm over here and you're, you're hunched over, but I wanna let you know that I love you so much that I will go to any length for you to see me just as I see you. I want you to see me as I am right now. And I think what he did, I think what he did is I think he let her know how much, how much he loved her. So she tries to look but her eyes can only see the floor. She's only seeing the, the floppy, dirty sandals of everybody around her. And I wondered, well, how did she go to him without knowing where he was? But it says this, I'll read it again. But when Jesus saw her, he called to her and said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid hands on her and immediately she was made straight. See, the moment that she comes in contact with Jesus. The moment that she, bring, she brought her infirmity to him, but he asked her to do something and be responsible to bringing it farther out, like you need to take a step. I'm saying that to you right now, if someone here is with an infirmity, you can't just wait for Jesus, you have to move toward Jesus. You can't just wait for him to take it away from you. You have to go to him and hand it to him to acknowledge that you have this thing. That's what he said, come to me. So when I was in college, I had this huge dark cloud over me. I've told the story, maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't. I'm not gonna go into detail, but I felt so much like I disappointed my dad. Now that you know a little bit about him, he was so smart. He had so many degrees behind his name and all these letters that were amazing. I fail out of college and I'm waiting for him to pick me up at college. 
And I'll never forget, I came down the steps, I'm like, man, he's gonna be so mad, he's gonna yell, he's gonna be disappointed in me, and all of these things that I really believed were true. But when my dad came to get me and load up all my stuff in the station wagon, remember the station wagons? Remember the, yeah, those were always fun. Station wagon. I just remember him doing this. Hey, babe, come here, come here, come here. It's okay, it's okay. It's all right, you're gonna be okay. It's all right. I remember just being so astounded by that. This man, this educated man, who was so smart in my eyes, would just grab me and hold me. He didn't reprimand me. In fact, you know what? He didn't even talk about it the whole way home. He didn't talk about it with me. You know, I see Jesus like that. He, the first step to accessing intimacy with God is not holiness, it's helplessness. And there's some kind of helplessness that Jesus needs to know that we can't do it on our own, that we're not able to accomplish the task by ourselves. Because he's given us an ability to be able to go to him He's given us an ability to be able to reach to him when he's reaching to us, and he will do things that no one else can do. And he's not gonna reprimand you. He's not gonna put you down. He's not gonna say, man, I know what all you did. He's gonna say, come here, I got you, girl. I got you, guy. I love you both, and I wanna help you along your way. So the first step for intimacy is not holiness. We think it's holiness. If I know more, if I, if I can read more, if I can memorize more, it's not that. How helpless are you? How much do you need Jesus? How much can you access him? How much are you willing to give him? Because see, here's the thing. You open up just a little crack, that hardened heart. Right now, you have that hardened heart. If you open up a little bit, the light that God will put inside of you, the light that he will ingest and inject into you is so much brighter than anything you've ever experienced but you have to open up just a little bit. So this means you can't heal yourself. You can't heal yourself. When your heart is hard, and I don't know if you can heal yourself, you can't always help yourself. You can't fix yourself. See, we need Jesus. We need Jesus. You have a lump in your breast and it says that you're not gonna make it. We need Jesus. You lost your spouse, your husband, your wife. You have a prodigal child that has gone astray that you can't get to come home and they're doing things and you know that it's not good for their life. So you need Jesus. You're worried about next month's bills. You don't know how it's gonna hand, hand, be handled. You need Jesus. Life feels heavy and weighty and there's a spirit of infirmity on you and you can't straighten up. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. See, when Jesus looks at you, he's your favorite. I mean, you're his favorite. You're his favorite. Did you know that? You're his favorite. You're his favorite. You're his favorite. You're his favorite. Doesn't matter how many people in here, I could go all around the room. You're his favorite. You're his favorite. Like everybody here is his favorite. He doesn't have, he's not a respecter of persons. God's not a respecter of persons. He loves us all equally. He loves us all so much that he's not willing to look away. He's a, he, he wants to acknowledge the spirit of infirmity. He's not gonna look away when you feel disabled. He's not gonna look away from you. He's gonna find you. He's gonna see you back in the corner. He's gonna see you in the, the crowd today. He's gonna see you amongst all of the people that are here today. He's gonna see you because he loves you that much and you're his favorite. That's his favorite. You're his favorite. PT, can you come up here for a minute, please? Okay, I'm gonna go old school just for a second. And just because I said this is kind of organic today, um, again, I can't remember if I said this or not, if I did appease me, let me say it again. I just feel like God has us in a different place this week. I feel like things need to be broken off of people. I feel like um, there are people in the room who have that spirit of infirmity, who have been opening and closing their box, and it just has all that collection of things in there. And I'm just gonna ask you right now, if that's you, I just want you to stand up. I just want you to stand up. That's you right now. Just stand up. Yeah. Yep. You have a need? Yep. You have a need? You have something inside of you right now that you're struggling with? Maybe it's something from your past? Yep. People still standing up? Yep. Maybe it's something right now that's happening that no one knows about, only you know about. You're struggling to that place where only you know about that thing that's going on in your life. That's you. I just want you to stand up. What I want to do is I want to pray 
two prayers. The first prayer I wanna pray is your relationship with Jesus. PT, you wanna pray for us, please? Yeah. Father, we're just, uh, man, here we are. It's just us and you, just me and you. And I'm just gonna talk to you for a minute. If you just keep your heads bowed, eyes closed. Uh, as Pastor Lynn has been talking, I think that many of us can relate and we're just spiritually bent over. And I don't know what's happened to you in your life. I don't know if it's years ago, I don't know if it's just recently, but uh, something has uh, affected us, changed us, and maybe we're here in our, if we're being really honest, our, our heart is a little hard. And it's just a really difficult time right now. But I just know this, that what Pastor Linda just said from the word of God is that if you'll just take one step towards Jesus, he's calling you today. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what's happened, he's calling you today. So if you're here and that's you and you're like, Jesus, I'm, I'm taking a step towards you. Would you would you put your hand up right now? I'm, I'm going to take the step. I'm going to do what I need to do. Just put your hand up. Say, I got to, man, I got to take a step today. I've been waiting for Jesus to come to me. And maybe this whole time, Jesus has been waiting for me to come to him. So father, here we are. We're taking a step. God, we give you our heart back. Take it, heal it, put it back together. All the areas that are broken and God, help us be the person that you've created us to be before the beginning of time. We don't want to go one more day, God, going back into our collection. God, we, we, just, we just want that box to be gone. We want to be whole. We want to be healed. So we're taking the step, Jesus, so that you can put us back together. Um, you guys can put your hands down. For anyone who wants a stronger relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've stepped away from that. Maybe you're the person right now that you've been coming to church, but you just want to be stronger in Jesus. You want to, um, you've walked away from him a little bit and you've maybe done some things or thought some things or been in places and um, you don't have that intimate relationship with him right now, but you want to have that intimate relationship with him, with him. That you want to be in a place where you can be secure in knowing that you are as close as you possibly can be, that you can, you've, he's called to you to please come and bring your infirmity. Come to me and bring your infirmity. And you're at that place right now, you wanna take the step, but you're a little bit nervous. You're a little bit afraid. What are people gonna think? I'm gonna ask you, if that's you, to stand up as well. If that's you, and you might already be standing. Yeah, I see more people standing up. Yep, yep, more people standing up. Thank you for your bravery. Thank you for your bravery. And then PT, would you pre please pray over um, anyone who maybe doesn't know Jesus? Yes, Father, here we are. And it starts when we, it's not about us being holy. It's about us being helpless. Yes. And we're admitting, God, that without you, we have nothing. And there's people in this room right now, and maybe you've doubted, maybe you've wondered, um, maybe you've wandered. And But now is a moment where it's really personal for you and God. And you're like, man, if this is real, Jesus, if you are who you said you are, I can't keep going back and forth. I keep doing uh, exactly what I know I shouldn't be doing, and I feel guilty, and then I'm like, I'm in this cycle, and you need to break that pattern today. And this is the day that you say, Jesus, I am coming home. I'm going all in. I'm releasing my sin, my shame, my guilt, and my pain to you. And in return, I'm gonna receive, God, your goodness. You're gonna put me back together and you're going to point me in a new direction. And that is for somebody today. You've been going in a direction that you need to change it right now. You cannot continue on the path that you've been on because that path does not lead to life, it leads to death. But there is a path that leads to life. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. For anyone in the room that you, you need to know, man, God, I belong to you. I'm releasing my sin. I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust you as my savior. Right now, if that's you, and you need to know, just put your hand up right now. God, I need to know, man, I need to know. Just put your hand up. Yeah, hand's still going up. 
I need to know, Father, you see our hands lifted. Your word says that if anyone comes to you, God, that you won't turn us away, but you will welcome us into your kingdom. If we believe in our hearts, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. So God, thank you for doing what only you can do right here in this holy moment in our church as we prepare our hearts and you prepare the way. Yes. Amen and amen. Thank you.